Alright, greetings everybody, uh, YouTube and whoever else uh, uh, comes to see this uh, video. I'm making this video about ham radio. I've had some people interested in it. I've been a licensed ham for about 10 years. And so I thought I'd explain a few things. Now, any of you stumbling across this radio, uh, any, any of you stumbling across the uh, video to begin with, um, maybe you don't know what ham radio is. Well, ham radio, as a term anyways, is, is uh, simply uh, slang for amateur radio. Amateur radio is a uh, service that you can use as a civilian in order to talk uh, two-way communications uh, to people either within your area or uh, across the world even. Um, you have to be licensed in order to do it. Um, used to, there wasn't any licensing, and then along came the FCC in the 30s uh, with the Telecommunications Act of 1934, I believe it was. And now we have to be licensed for it uh, because the FCC polices the airwaves. Amateur radio operators have a very uh, large number of bands and frequencies that they are allowed to use. Each one of these bands within the radio spectrum uh, has different characteristics and capabilities. Um, some are, you know, you can maybe talk across the state or into the next state, and some you can talk within your county. And, uh, others you can talk across the world with, and a lot of it depends upon your your equipment and, and your proficiency at operating it. Um, right now, this evening, I've been kind of putting my system back together. It's, it's had some problems and been neglected because I have to work a night shift and I'm not ever around when everybody else is, <laughs> is on the radio so I actually have not been operating that much so I, I've been uh, fixing up one of my antennas uh, today. I've got another one left to fix up. Uh, and on top of that I I have some noise problems with some some bad electrical lines in, in my neighborhood that I have not fixed so uh, some of the frequencies I can't use because I can't hear anything on because all I hear is noise off the electrical systems in my neighborhood. I digress on that. <clears throat> Ham radio is used uh, for a couple of different things. The hobby is. Um, people might get into the hobby for the technical aspect of it. They want the technical challenge. Others might want to get into the hobby uh, just to what they call rag chewing. Um, or just to talk to people as a, as a social sort of thing. Um, a number of people in the ham radio community get into it for one of its major uh, purposes and creeds is civil disaster communications. Um, <clears throat> ham radio is a much simpler type of radio than a lot of other two ways. Um, it's very basic analog signals for the most part, there are some digital signals that are fairly easy to uh, get into. Uh, but they're not vendor specific, for instance. If you go into public service or two-way uh, for fleet radios, it is very possible to buy a radio system that only works with itself. And so when you have a fleet, it's not necessarily a big deal. Um, you simply equip all your fleet vehicles and your base stations and everything with the same radios and that's fine. Uh, when it comes to public service, however, uh, you do run into a couple of issues. There are lots of different systems out there, not everybody buys systems that can talk to each other. Uh, despite the big push for adopting um, <clears throat> a common system after 9-11 because they, they realized how bad their communications were, in a lot of areas, um, that push hasn't completely taken hold or, or taken hold at all. Uh, I know locally our police and city here, in the city I live in, our police and, and city officials uh, use a radio system that's a little bit off. And their previous system was a little bit off. And nobody works with it. And so, on a day-to-day -day sort of thing, if they have to leave the city limits, and leave the radio range of, of where they're at, uh, say, for instance, uh, which has happened before on a car chase, um, they have to call back with their cell phone back to their dispatch 
while they're, you know, running down the highway 90 mile an hour chasing some guy. It's not necessarily all that ideal. Um, <clears throat> so, the idea behind ham radio is ham radio is a set of frequencies that all the hams know. It's a very common uh, um, way of doing things. They have what are known as band plans, such as certain frequencies are used um, <clears throat> in certain ways so that if you go to these frequencies, you'll know how to talk to somebody else. For instance, you know, so one frequency may be used for sideband, another set of frequencies may be used for FM uh, type of signals, this sort of thing. This is all organized out and, and very well published and known in the ham community, and so the hams can go search out other hams on the frequencies and they know how to find them and, and they can operate. Uh, you see instances of uh, Hurricane Katrina where Katrina took out a lot of infrastructure, hams are still talking. Uh, accident that they had that NASA had with Shuttle Columbia. Uh, they called up ham radio operators to be attached to the search teams because they knew all the hams could, could talk to each other and that they could have a common communications thread whereas not all the departments involved could talk to each other uh, natively. Let's talk for a second about why it might be good if for uh, being prepared uh, for a disaster in your area, why it might be a good, good uh, idea to be a ham. So it's, besides the obvious fact that a natural disaster may in fact just annihilate and completely demolish your infrastructure to the point where it's unusable. Let's also talk about <clears throat> when we see, like we did on uh, September 11th in New York and Washington, that the uh, communications infrastructure couldn't hold up. And there's this little dirty secret that most people don't know about, and it's not really that much of a secret, but the, your average person in the, in the community doesn't know about it, and that is when it comes to the, your infrastructure for your power, for your communications, etc. <clears throat> that infrastructure is, is grossly oversold. Um, they don't have a dedicated line uh, just for you to call long distance out all the time. They have a set of lines that's shared by your community and it's a much smaller number than what your community is. Uh, so when, if there's a major disaster in your area and you need to call out or people want to call in, there's a very, very small number of lines. Uh, that can come in and out of your town. An example of this, uh, this happens throughout all of in infrastructure, an example of this would be, uh, take for instance back in the uh, uh, days of dial-up modem for internet. <clears throat> the, the original uh, service providers, internet service providers that used dial-up modems had a ratio of about 8 to 1 or a 10 to 1. In other words, 8 customers or 10 customers, uh, depending on how they 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 uh, did it with their pocket, but 8 to 10 customers per modem that they had. They did this under the, uh, under the assumption, and the correct assumption, I might say, that in normal operation, not everybody would be calling in at the same time. And that's fine, but when there's a disaster, it's not normal operation. Everybody and their dog's uncle decides they need to, you know, go call and check on Aunt Rose. Uh, and see whether she's okay or, you know, their niece or their nephew or, you know, their grandparents are okay in the, in the, in the disaster area or even close to it. Um, and what you see is that a lot of this infrastructure begins to fail when it, when it comes up to capacity or, or, or when it gets pushed to capacity. It will fail without having physical damage. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff is microprocessor, micro, uh, control digital uh, systems and it, it's like your computer you know you stick your computer 100% CPU usage everything just kind of comes to a crawl same thing happens on the phone systems uh, and everything else so it doesn't require physical um, doesn't require physical damage in order to attack the infrastructure and there have even been historical instances where there were bugs in the phone system that caused cascade failures. We've seen cascade failures of electrical systems in the Northeast before. There's lots of things that can hurt your infrastructure. Um, so, you know, if, if you have a disaster, if you have an emergency, being able to talk to somebody is a good thing. Uh, that's, that's pretty much a given. So let's go over <laughs> real quick 
uh, what you can do with ham, uh, how, how to get started with ham. Uh, in order to do your ham in order to get your ham radio license, you have to take a test. There are three different licenses. There's what they call technician, general, and extra. Technician is your introductory level. Uh, I believe it's about 35 uh, questions uh, in order to pass the test. You, best place, best thing to do is go look up your local amateur radio club. Uh, you know, do a search for, it's probably going to be in whatever nearest metro area you have. Do a search for that metro's name and, uh, you know, amateur radio club, and I'm sure somebody will be there. <clears throat> Look for their test schedule. Uh, there has to be three uh, hams there that are what are called volunteer examiners, along with a, one volunteer exam coordinator. Uh, they all have to be a higher class than you, I believe. Uh, in order to give you a license up until extra and then you can't get any higher than that. <clears throat> um, so you'll pay $15 I think is what the going rate is nowadays. Uh, you'll take your test and then they'll grade it there on the spot tell you whether you passed or not. And send your paperwork in and you'll get your license. It'll take a little while. You're, you're, as part of your license you'll be issued a call sign. Now, forewarning, this call sign is in a publicly searchable database, and uh, you basically forego your right uh, to your Fourth Amendment when it comes to your radio equipment once you are licensed. The FCC thinks you've done something wrong as part of being a licensee. They have claimed the right to inspect and confiscate your equipment as they see necessary. Now, in practice, they don't run around like the Gestapo doing it. <clears throat> okay, so the FCC may not even decide to uh, inspect your equipment. They may turn around and just track you down to wherever you're at and when they see that it's coming from your house at your address, they send you this fun little thing called the letter and it's a notice of apparent liability and they basically say you've broke the rules and now we're going to slap a fine on you and if you want to talk to us about it you can go through our procedures to you know at hearings and whatnot and, and the fines get pretty steep especially once you're licensed because they assume you know better uh, you know like ten thousand dollars per violation sort of thing uh, but if you think about it it takes you know, essentially multiple uh, reports and then they have to, you know, track you down. Once they hear the sit once they know there's a signal to look for, they have to wait for the signal and then have it going along and track you down. So basically they, they really go after repeat offenders when it comes to that sort of thing. But there is the ability there to have a you know, have, have them cause some very bad days. So those are the caveats about getting ham license. But anyways, so you'll go take your test, they'll send you a license, you'll get a call sign. You are not allowed to transmit as a ham radio operator uh, without a call sign. Now the one thing the SEC does that is a uh, common sense, uh, just right off the bat, is the FCC says if there's a you know threat of loss of life or property, um, yeah, rules be damned. If you need to get a hold of somebody, you can get a hold of somebody, even on a frequency you're not licensed to use. Uh, <laughs> if you pop up on your local sheriff's frequency, they're not necessarily going to be happy about it. But if it's a life or death situation, there's not much they can do about it. Um, as far as retribution for, for you coming up on their frequency. Um, very rare sort of thing though nowadays with cell phones. Uh, so let's talk a little bit. With technician, you basically end up on what we call VHF and higher, uh, which is a uh, we also, the, the starting band that you, you, you're on is 6 meters, it's around 50 megahertz. 
and it goes up from there. You get 50 megahertz, you run the 140s, um, there's a little bit of 220 megahertz, 440 megahertz, uh, 900 and the 1.2 gig, 2.4 gig, various bands on up from there. Uh, the higher the, uh, the frequency, the more line of sight it becomes in, in, in local, so that you have to have uh, elevation and power to, to get you anywhere. Um, and really, you're only going to get, you know, to the horizon plus maybe a small percentage, depending on what the frequency is. Uh, some of the fre some of the really high stuff, just dead line of sight. You can't have anything between you. Uh, but it, you know, the higher the frequency, uh, you know, you get into the 2.4. That's what your Wi-Fi uses. You push some data across that, but you can't push it over the horizon. Uh, the lower frequencies that you get into, you get into them with general and extra, and, and, and while general can get into them, extra has more privileges, they can go into more frequencies than general can. And the lower frequencies, what we call the HF bands, it starts uh, 10 meters on down, which uh, 10 meters is like 28 megahertz. Uh, and then you go down, the lowest band they have there is uh, 160 meters, that's 1.6 meg, I believe. Um, and when you get into these lower frequencies, you can talk quite a bit of distance, and they have different characteristics. They will work better at certain times of the day or night, depending on which band you're looking at. Uh, and this is all things that can be studied within the um, within the material. Um, and I have heard people from literally across the globe before. I have been at contest with the local uh, radio club and uh, heard people in Australia talking. Uh, I did not make contact with them because I was doing something else, but, uh, you know, you when I say you can talk all over the world, I mean you can talk all over the world. So, but for technician, you're not going to necessarily do that. It's going to be regional, local communication. What gets you out anywhere in the world of the technician is what's called a repeater, and I have one tuned up here for a second, so let me, um, let me dial this up here. Actually, let me tune up a, uh, where is it? Let me tune that one up. Now, what a repeater does, and this is what you'll use a lot of when you get into ham, what a repeater does is it has a receiver and a transmitter on different frequencies. Now, when you see me hit the button on this to transmit, you'll see my display change. It'll transmit on a different frequency, and when I let off, it switches back to what you, this frequency you see right now. It's going to listen to it. Now, repeaters are usually put somewhere at elevation with good antennas and a little bit of power. It's really not power that's going to help you. It's that antenna and that elevation that really gets you places. Uh, I might be pushing more power at times than the repeater is, but if the repeater's at a thousand foot above the ground, eh, you know, it'll reach out a few places. Uh, so this one is actually probably about 15, 20 miles away, if I'd take a guess. I, I haven't ever mapped it. And it can talk over some of the geographical hills that we have here that I may not be able to talk directly over with the frequency, with this set of frequencies of this band I'm on. So the repeater is sitting on one of these hills and I can relay off of it and into another county or, or two over uh, so that people can hear me off of it where normally I wouldn't be able to reach them because there'd be a hill in the way on this uh, high of a UHF frequency. This is line of, uh, fairly line of sight sort of deal. So it's at some altitude. And so everybody can hear the repeater and the repeater can talk to everybody or you know within a, within a great range and so it extends your range quite a bit. And it's pretty simple. This is the KC5EZZ length repeater. 10 12 pm at 49 degrees. And that's the repeater's automated controller. KD5 SFK testing. Clear? KC5EZZ weather length repeater. So, <clears throat> that's the automated controller. It's got a digitized voice on it. A lot of repeaters, oh, say for instance, like the one I was just on, 
uh, controllers, not necessarily that fancy. It just identified itself with Morse code. KD5 SMK testing. So, the, um, <laughs> just in case somebody comes back to me, I turn the volume down so I don't hear them. Interrupt my, interrupt my video. Um, so that just identified itself with Morse code. Um, you and whatever the repeater is considered remote equipment, you and whatever remote equipment that you're under control of, have to, you have to identify yourself every 10 minutes. That's why they're set up to be able to talk or send out Morse code. And you have to do it when you're talking. You have to give your call sign out. <coughs> so the, um, this allows you to reach out. That first repeater I was on is even set up with its controller, and it has what's called a remote base, which is a third part of the system that you know you have your normal receiver part of the uh, of it and the transmitter part of it well then you have another transceiver sitting there and it can link out into other repeaters so it can actually link over into other uh, communities and and uh, we use this for our uh, um, storm spotting crews around here and they can literally link these systems together across many 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 number of counties uh, you can also link systems together across the internet, which is fun to play with, but you wouldn't count on it in the disaster necessarily. There's a couple of different projects to do that, Echolink, uh, IRLP, or Internet uh, uh, Repeater Linking Protocol, I believe is what it stands for. Um, <clears throat> and a few others. Uh, those are the two most common ones. Uh, you can do... Going back to modes, you can do television. You can do what's called slow scan TV, fast scan TV. Um, you can do digital. I think I was on a digital ago. I'm not on it anymore, but um, one of the common digital frequencies uh, is APRS frequency, which uh, relays everybody's GP, which relays GPS coordinates. So you can tie a radio modem to a radio with the GPS and it will relay your GPS coordinates while you're on the move. This is good for asset tracking uh, <clears throat> during uh, maybe operation, specific operations like during the disaster or um, ham radio people are also known to help with public events, uh, you know, races and this sort of thing and so you can use a, uh, APRS in order to track assets during the public event. Um, <clears throat> there's various digital modes to send data. Um, they have a new digital voice modulation scheme called D-Star. Um, it has not gained wide, widespread acceptance. We don't have any around here, and I don't have any of the radios. They're a little bit pricey. Um, and I'm waiting for, right now only ICOM has them. Uh, so not everybody's adopted them. Uh, once that protocol makes its way into other radios uh, it might be doing pretty good it provides really really good voice um, they also have digital HF stuff going on uh, <coughs> for digital voice there's a, a common digital um, text protocol that you can do in HF all across the world is what they call PSK 31 phase shift key 31 meaning 31 characters per second it's pretty slow data um, there's all sorts of things you can do to play with this stuff. And, uh, you know. Okay, so my camera keeps cutting out and I'm sitting here uh, editing the video together as uh, as it cuts out. It, I'm doing a uh, high def for you guys sitting here to watch the radio screen. It's uh, all sorts of special. Um, short bus special or something. Anyways, uh, my camera hits 4 gig file size and it cuts out. So it's about 12 minutes. Alright, so let me uh, let me wrap this up as quick as I can here. Um, I was talking about digital data modes. Uh, there's all sorts of things you can do. They make uh, bulletin board systems for uh, packet, digital packet, which happens at the UHF, VHF frequencies. Uh, that PSK31, there are some projects out there like uh, Wingate and then uh, with the Linux RMS, I believe is what it is. Uh, the email gateways uh, via VHF, or, excuse me, via HF, um, 
so that with an HF radio and uh, you know uh, digital modulation and a computer um, and, and the digital modulation in all actuality for a lot of the stuff you can do off of computer sound cards so with a proper interface between your computer sound card and your rig and a rig you know that can reach wherever I mean you could check email uh, text email you know via uh, HF frequencies um, wherever you're at so there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of things you can do with HF it's a, like I say it's a hobby somebody somebody's playing with it they're coming up with new ways to to do things all the time new di new new modes new digital modes um, this sort of thing my cat's about to bug me here hopefully he didn't knock the camera around um, your your big expense is going to be the radio. This radio you're looking at it is probably in the neighborhood of uh, between seven hundred and a thousand dollars for this radio. Um, they don't make it anymore. The equivalent radio that they the the newer model of it is probably somewhere in that neighborhood. I have not specifically looked at its price. This is a recently discontinued uh, model. I've had it for a number of years. Uh, and then you got, and that, that that's just the radio. That didn't come with an antenna. That didn't come with power supply, anything else. Um, I also have on here what's called an antenna tuner, uh, which matches certain electrical characteristics of the radio, the le different electrical characteristics of your antenna to ensure that you have a a good feed into your antenna and that you're not reflecting signal uh, back into your radio, which can happen. It's what's called a SWR mismatch. It can cause signal reflection back into the radio. It can burn up components when that happens. So, you know, you throw another, you know, $100 for the antenna tuner is what I, I think I paid about $100, $125 for mine. So, it's, it's a pretty simple one for an automatic tuner. Um, you can get manual tuners where you can do it yourself by uh, looking at some, uh, looking at some meters. A little, little less expensive, but the auto tuner is pretty simple. Um, I've got a used like old old school from the 90s uh, radio modem I picked up from somebody used I don't even remember how much just to play around with um, and then the antenna is uh, my antenna is basically just wire uh, I don't really have anything complex because I don't have a uh, tower set up yet I don't, I, I don't have the a place to mount like a, a good hefty size antenna so right now my antenna is a it's called a, a dipole antenna it's a, basically a wire uh, and but dipoles work. You can get places with them. Uh, now a good beam antenna, uh, you know, can really really get you places, especially once you about 35 foot or more. And some people go nuts. Some people have really huge antenna arrays. Um, some of the HF guys have some pretty good size antenna stuff going on. Um, you you want to see an antenna array that'll mess with you they do what's called an EME Earth Moon Earth or, or what they call a moon bounce where they'll literally pump a high enough uh, wattage signal out and they'll bounce it off the moon and back to the earth in order to talk to somebody um, that's always interesting uh, and that's and ham radio has satellites they have they have volunteers that have put satellites in orbit they raise they go through fundraisers they've put satellites in orbit um, they're not exactly, you know, big budget things, so a lot of them aren't working anymore. Uh, but there are some. Uh, all NASA missions have uh, ham radio operators on them with rigs. Uh, you can talk to the International Space Station. Uh, before the shuttle was decommissioned, you could talk to the shuttle. Um, I don't know how it's going to work with um, the new SpaceX missions. Um, NASA's NASA's uh, um, protocol has been that every time they they fly an astronaut, at least one of them's a ham radio operator with a rig on board. So um, it's kind of an interesting hobby for those that want to get involved in it. I got involved in it because I was going to electronic school. Um, it is now one of the things I consider that helps make me a little more prepared for natural disasters should something happen. Um, 
you know, my neighbors might end up coming to me if they want to uh, be able to talk outside of the outside of the city to let you know extended family or something know that they're okay. Um, and so there's not a whole lot I can I, there's not really a whole lot I can think of uh, else to tell you. That's sort of the basics of it all. Um, it is an expensive hobby for your upfront cost to to buy radios, but once you've got the radios bought, eh, it's it's relatively minimal. You'll buy maybe something every once in a while, a little toy or something. Or I bought you know some copper pipe today to build an antenna. Um, and antennas are just tubing and wire. Um, once you understand the formulas of them, you can build your own antennas. You don't have to go buy an antenna. Um, technician is going to be your cheapest. This is the radio you're looking at. Is an all, like I said, it's an all band all mode. It's meant for general and extra classes, so it does a lot of things that a technician wouldn't need. Um, therefore, more bells and whistles means more dollar. Um, four or five hundred dollars probably get you a brand name mobile rig. Uh, maybe with an uh, antenna if you do your shopping right. I haven't looked at prices recently. Maybe more than that. Um, recently, one of the things that happened is that they have radios coming out of China. Um, these are wideband receive, wideband transmit, uh, and they'll work inside handbands. Now, they're selling them in here in China, but the only way you can legally use them is if you're a ham. This is one of the things that. Uh, this is one of the things that uh, I see some people talking about the, these these cheapo uh, Chinese rigs. Let me make this very, very clear to you. Every time a radio is created, it goes through what's called an FCC type acceptance. And if it's not type accepted for the service you're broadcasting in, the FCC... Yeah, it's a violation. The FCC will get after you if they find out you're doing it. It is technically illegal. Now, in a, in a major disaster state, I don't know that anybody's necessarily going to care if that's what you're going to keep one around for, but for normal use, it's a no-no. Um, it's only legal in the ham radio community because there are people in the ham radio community that build their own radio, so the ham radio community does not need uh, specific type acceptances. They have their own type within their, uh, uh, I, guess, I guess you could call it a type. It's really a certain part of the rules. They have their own part, rule part that says you don't need a type acceptance. Um, and you can transmit on whatever you can transmit on. That's why it's legal for ham radio people to use it, but only within their frequencies unless there's a, you know, some sort of a disaster. And a lot of those those Chinese radios will, will broadcast in frequencies you're not supposed to be on. So you got to be really, really careful with that. Just because you buy when you pick it up and you click the talk button and then it'll let you talk doesn't necessarily mean you need to be talking where you're at. You need to keep an eye on your band, on what band you're at, what frequency you're at, and see if you're legal. Um, so, but the flip side to that is, is you can pick them up less than hundred dollars. You can pick up a handheld. Uh, from China for less than $100. Um, I'm pretty sure I paid several times that for my ICOM handheld that I've had for a number of years. So, are they a good deal? Yeah, if that, as long as they work, if they've got a half-decent reputation. But there's some caveats to it you need to be, you need to be aware of. Um, don't see a lot of uh, mobile or base station China units. So if you want to go that route, you're going to cough up some money. Um, 5 watt handheld is good enough for talking around town. You can get adapters and put antennas on your car and use it as a kind of a pseudo mobile unit. Um, you'd have to put an amplifier on it though to, to make it talk any distance like a mobile unit would. My mobile unit in my vehicle is a... Uh, well, handheld units are usually about 4 or 5 watts. Mobile unit in my vehicle, depending upon which band I'm on, uh, 35 watts for UHF, 50 watts for VHF. Um, this unit you're looking at right here will do 100 watts on HF and uh, oh, I think uh, 20 watts on VHF or something like that. I'd have to look at, I mean on UHF and 
maybe 50 or 35 on VHF. I'd, I'd have to look up the specs for the VH and UHF. I, I haven't really cared lately, but I know it's 100 watt uh, on the HF bands to reach out and touch somebody. In a fairly mobile package, that what you're seeing is a faceplate. Uh, the rest of the radio isn't much different in dimensions than that. It's just deeper. The, the face is remoted off. It's on a remote kit just sitting on the, on the front, end of, front edge of that shell. So, you know, your little 5 watt cheapo handhelds, yeah, if you're in an urban area uh, or, or you're relatively close to repeat or somewhere, yes, they'll work. Um, you know, I'm hitting this one 15 miles away and I'm, I'm probably only putting a couple of watts out, but I'm, I've got a pretty decent antenna sitting on, on the outside. And that's the other thing you have to think about is spend your money on your antennas, not necessarily your radio. This is actually a low end radio for HF. The top end ICOM right now is like $12,000. Huge unit. All the bells and whistles. Probably a really good unit, but put your money in your antennas first before you put them into your radio because the antenna is what's doing the work. The radio is making the signal, but the antenna is actually what's pushing the signal out. So um, always, 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 always put more money into your antenna before you think about putting money into your radio. I can't stress that enough. Uh, when I when I first got started, I bought a I bought an okay radio and I bought a really good antenna. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, my camera's uh, fighting with me. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you some clips of uh, ham radio in operation. We had a net earlier tonight, and um, a net is basically sort of a weekly exercise or what have you or how whatever time period of people just getting together and talking and exchanging that they're there and checking in with each other um, for the purposes of being prepared for if they ever have to do it. Um, one thing I would like to say is that there are some people I have run across online who um, who would who like the idea of ham radio but don't like the idea of having a license and having their information out in the public um, that they want a ham radio for for major emergencies but they don't they don't want to have the license and they figure well when everything goes to goes to hell in a handbasket the FCC is not going to be around and that's true um, you know at some level I, I guess it that's probably true if that's what they're planning for however what I would say if you are considering whether or not to get your license and or whether or not you just want to keep a, a radio around just just in case um, it's an awful big, big expenditure for just in case and number two is that once you're licensed and you're actually using your ham radio then you get good at it and I have been at community functions that are the local club has volunteered for and uh, I'm not an old guy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I was one of the younger guys when I was attending the club. I, I haven't lately uh, due to work uh, obligations. But, uh, you know, I was one of the younger guys. And at um, one point in time, we were doing a community function and providing communications for them. And I've had people remark that, you know, oh, well, you were very professional about how you did that. And I don't want to toot my own horn or you know let it, let it go to my head or what have you but <clears throat> I, I don't think anything of it because it's it's a hobby I mean it's what I do it, it, it's natural everybody else gets impressed with it but it's natural and there's a point to be taken from that which is practice makes perfect so get your license and get used to using the radio um, some of this stuff you may not necessarily pick up from a book. You may have to understand what bands are active and when and why and get used to using them, uh, you know, when it comes to HF frequencies. Um, get used to using them and how finicky they may be at certain times of the day uh, <clears throat> as to whether or not they're going to propagate to where you want them to. Uh, get used to talking the lingo and being able to talk efficiently in order to get your point across as sl as quickly as you can on the radio which I haven't done on this video but um, it, it's been so long I don't, I don't know where I'm going to uh, um, 
I, I, there's just so much to cover, I don't know where to stop. But, um, yeah, so I would encourage people to get their license. I understand that it puts your information out there. You've heard me say my call sign. You can punch that into a Google search and find me. I normally don't like to uh, advertise uh, a lot about me, so this is a little bit of a departure from most of my other... Alright, so my camera keeps clicking off either because of file size and now because of battery, so I had to go hunt up a spare battery. Too many re-edits. Anyways, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, show you what I filmed earlier tonight, which was a net uh, that we had locally. Uh, just so you get an idea of, of uh, what basic traffic across, uh, across the radio frequency looks like. So, you guys have fun. I'm going to try to edit this down. It may end up getting broken to multiple videos. I don't know what YouTube, what's my upload limit be nowadays, but... I'll figure it out. Um, hopefully, I didn't bore everybody too much. Thanks for watching, guys. Yeah, this is KD5 UW. Uh, a couple of things to begin with. Uh, there will be no Aries uh, group meeting in December. Uh, it was canceled uh, because uh, it's so close to the holidays. So we will not have a, uh, a Aries group meeting in December. Uh, we'll next one will be in January. Uh, the net. Aries net will be tonight at 8.30 on the 444.350 repeater. And also remind everybody that the Skywarn Appreciation Day at the National Weather Service is this Saturday, the 1st, starting about 9 o'clock. Uh, we will be trying to set up the uh, antenna and all uh, late Friday afternoon. Uh, more information on that will be coming.
here at Tango Papa. My name is Tom Lillivig, and I uh, just recently got uh, my general license, so I've got both technician and general now. Thank you. Good day. Welcome to the uh, world of ham radio. We hope to uh, uh, see you at uh, the club meetings and at, at future uh, projects. And we once again appreciate you checking in and hope you check in at future net. Okay, at this time we will now take regular check-ins. I do ask you to give your call sign once phonetically and please try to avoid doubles. Uh, this is KB5 FMK. This is Alpha Echo 5 Alpha Whiskey. This is Whiskey 5 Uniform India. Kilo Foxtrot 5 Quebec Kilo Georgia. Delta 5, Sierra, my kilo. Uh, dinner will be starting around 